be here in the house of the Lord Sunday, but I'm excited tonight to hear the word of the Lord from Pastor Ryan Franklin. Come deliver it, my friend, what the Lord has given you. Thank you, Pastor. So good to be in church with you tonight. Amen. 1 John 4, 16, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. You're welcome to stand if you'd like. First John 4, 16. It's always an honor to stand in this pulpit. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Lord, thank you so much for gathering us together tonight on this Wednesday night. Some of your people, Lord, are, are tired. They've worked all day, Jesus. But Lord, I pray that you would speak to them tonight through this teaching, preaching, whatever you want to call it. Lord, I pray, Jesus, that you would speak to them. Use my lips, use my mind, use my voice, Lord, to minister to these people. And Lord, I pray that each one would receive exactly what they need to receive tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. What's love got to do with it? I mean, it, it's a secondhand emotion, right? What's love got to do, got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? I'm just curious. What's love got to do, got to do with it? You know, I can remember a few years ago pulling into my driveway with my black XLT F-250. I don't know why I had that big truck. But I was about to come home to Angie and my two little kids, Olivia and Neil, they were little at the time, it was an extremely stressful day at work. And I was dealing with problems that I didn't feel adequate to deal with. I was giving from a well that had run dry. My emotions were sort of all over the place. And I had hidden these emotions all day long from the people that I ministered to at work. And now I was headed home. And I didn't know how to release the anxiety at that time. And was likely just going to sort of let it all out. And just try to recover somehow. And I didn't even have enough sense at the time to know how my young family would even react to me just sort of letting it all out. You see, they could hear the garage door raising. The truck was turning off. They could hear the truck door slamming. And I could just imagine their little faces sort of cringing as I'm about to walk through the door. Can you imagine that with me? They were just wondering, which dad would walk through the door? the loving father that they knew occasionally, or the moody, deadbeat father that would grunt a few words and then detach because he just had nothing left at the end of the day. You see, just a few years ago, I started seeing 1 Corinthians 13 through a different lens. And through the Lord and people in my life helping me mature 
and my ability to love, I began loving my family and others around me the way that Scripture tells me to love. And now, quite a few years later after that, that day, I remember pulling up into my driveway, just wasted from the day. Now the relationships in my life have drastically improved. They're not perfect, but they're so much better. And I still have these tough and I have these draining days, but my tank isn't empty at the end of the day anymore. And my emotions are much more stable. And I have so much more fulfillment in life. I don't, I don't, I don't have the burnout that I used to have. And best of all, my, my family actually enjoys hearing the garage door raise now. And sometimes even to this day, even as they've gotten older and much bigger, they even run and will greet me at the door with a big hug occasionally, even today. And now, as I reflect on my behavior as a young dad that I'm not very proud of, I ask myself, what's love got to do with it? And I can stand here in this pulpit today and I can say that love, love has everything to do with life. And I know now that love is life. You see, he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Love is one of the most confusing words in the universe. And we say things like, I love my mom, but then we turn around and say, I love my dog. And then we say, I love the mountains, I love the beach. I love my kids. I love my wife. I love my coffee. I mean, just think about it. We intertwine the word love with just about everything. And love has, has, has been even misused and abused since the beginning of time. And as we search scripture, the Bible says a ton of things about love all throughout the Bible. But 1 Corinthians 13 is the cornerstone for understanding the biblical definition of love. Love goes beyond just emotions and, and romance and the Bible shows that love is a guiding principle for life. And I want to dig into that a little bit today just to continue to build the case that love has everything to do with life because love is life. And when we look at the context of, of the scripture, we see that the apostle Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 13. And also we see that it's sort of sandwiched right in the middle of two extended chapters on spiritual gifts. And although these spiritual gifts are they're tremendous blessing and a great need for the life of the church, especially for POA, but like all good gifts, they can easily be misused and abused. And Paul is highlighting in 1 Corinthians 13 that the atmosphere of these spiritual gifts should function in an environment of love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. And I'm going to replace the word charity with love as I read today. It says... Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. 
And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profit me nothing. And in these first few verses of, of chapter 13, Paul, he wasn't downgrading the use of tongues or, or prophecy or faith or sacrifice or any other gift of virtue. Paul was just simply elevating the need for love in the midst of all of those things. And he's saying that without love, all of these spiritual gifts and knowledge and, and faith and good deeds, they're, they're all meaningless. And I think back to my opening story about me coming home to, to Angie and my kids that one particular day. And I did all sorts of, of, of good things for others that day. I worked for the church. I <clears throat> helped people. I created processes at times and, and things that improve the working of the church. That's my gift. But what was all of that without being able to go home to my family and the people that were most precious to me and not have love for them at the end of the day? The people that mattered the absolute most to me. And it was all meaningless without that love. And that's what these first few verses are saying, that I wasn't really living life very well. Because love has everything to do with life. Love is life. And those first few verses of 1 Corinthians 13, they, they really establish the supremacy of love. And then these next few verses, verses 4 through 7, they walk through the characteristics of love. And as I read through these, I, I want you to grab hold of, I'm, I'm going to sort of explain them as I read them, but I, wanna, uh, I, wanna, I want you to grab hold of at least one characteristic in your mind that you feel that you need to work on today in your life. I want you to grab hold of that. Would you do that for me? 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love suffereth long. So love is patient with, with the tough stuff in life. And love is kind. Love envieth not, so so it doesn't unhealthily seek other people's qualities or, or stuff. Love vaunteth not itself. So it doesn't brag. It doesn't boast about it. It's not puffed up. Love isn't arrogant or, or snobbish. Verse 5. Does not behave itself unseemly. So in other words, love isn't rude or 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 it's not considerate of others. It's not not considerate of others. Seeketh not her own. When we truly love, we put God and others even before ourselves. Is not easily provoked. This means that we're not easily angered. We're not easily irritated. And it's not something that we have to hide within us and then unmask when we get home. Thinketh no evil. That means we're not keeping record of the wrongs of others or, or, or their past mistakes. And, and when we learn to love, we learn to forgive and, and just sort of let go of things. Verse six, rejoiceth not in iniquity. When we see injustice or, or when we see harm to others, that's not something that we're going to rejoice over. It's actually going to sort of sadden us. But rejoiceth in the truth. So we value what is right and good and truthful. Verse 7, beareth all things. This doesn't mean that we have to bear everything. 
We have limits, but it does mean that we help carry or endure things sometimes. We may even help carry the burdens of others at times, right? Believeth all things. Again, we, we don't just gullibly believe everything that we hear. This just means that we have the attitude that assumes the best in others. We have a more trusting attitude than a distrusting attitude. Hopeth all things. This means that we never consider another person just to be a lost cause. There's nobody in here, nobody watching by way of web that's a lost cause. Endureth all things. This means that we can stay in difficult situations for the sake of someone else instead of trying to find a way of e an easy way of escape. And so there you have it. That's the biblical characteristics of love outlined by Paul himself. And then he keeps going on and, and, and he begins to show the, the permanence of love. And he explains how love is enduring. Let's keep reading, verse eight. Love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away those childish things. I matured in my love. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abide us faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. You see, love is enduring. Love is going to outlast any other gift. You could have some amazing gifts within you. You can even have some amazing accomplishments in life. Yet love is going to surpass any of those things. And you see, when we realize that love has everything to do with this life. We move from a partial and an incomplete nature of understanding and, and the use of those gifts to a full and complete nature where we fully understand and fully see God and we fully relate to the people that are most precious around us. You see, love has everything to do with life because love is life. So there you go. Now, Rob, just go out and live it. Go out and live 1 Corinthians 13 and you're good to go, right? Love is life, life is love, go live it out. And we all know that it's not that easy, right? Prior to that day, the day that I pulled up in the driveway with my black F-250 truck, and I realized just how bad that my family was struggling when, when I would come home, prior to that day, I had read 1 Corinthians 13 many, many, many times. Many times. In fact, unlike Pastor Gentry and Pastor Andrew who have unbelievable memories, I struggle with memorization. But this was one of the few chapters of the Bible that I had 
committed the entire chapter to memory. And I really believe that, that part of the reason that I did that was because there was something in me that just longed to live out life the way that this chapter showed to live it out. So why wasn't I long-suffering and kind? Why was I full of envy at times? Why was I not enduring everything in my life and finding hope in, in everything like Scripture tells us to? Why? And here's the simple answer. I wasn't truly internalizing those verses. I knew what they meant on the surface. I had studied them in detail. I could give you definitions of, e of each of those terms, but I didn't have a clue of the depth of those verses. And I must be honest, I, I, was, I was a little clueless. I didn't know what love really had to do with it. I didn't know what love really had to do with my success and my enjoyment in life. And then secondly, I didn't realize that, that love is not just words that are said to someone. And I didn't realize that our ability to love can expand and can grow yes. and even mature. Amen. And it's through the growth of the internal of our being yes, and through the growth of our character. Hallelujah. And it's oftentimes through the healing of our deepest and our darkest wounds yes, that we can truly realize that love has everything to do with life because love is life. So tonight, rather than just giving you the scripture and, and just, Rob, just letting you just sort of run with it, I want to give you four things that, that I have learned along the way that has helped me love people better. And it's sort of my interpretation of, of 1 Corinthians 13. Now, I have to warn you here. This may sound like way overly simple on the surface. You may even think that, that you're truly and adequately doing all of these things. I know I did at one time. But I encourage you to, to take a few notes tonight. And as simple as it may sound, I want you to really really evaluate your life through the lens of these four things. Here's the first one. Number one, you gotta love yourself first. Now, this is a critical, critical first step. And I'm not gonna rehash this in any detail. I taught this a couple of months ago in here. Um, and I would encourage you to, if you're struggling in this area, or you did not listen to my message on loving yourself, I would encourage you to go find that. It was in December. Um, and, and watch that message. But I'll say this about loving yourself. Luke 4.18 tells us, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty, to set at liberty them that are bruised. I want you to point at yourself right now. Say, I've been bruised. There's not a person in this room that has not been bruised. And so when the Lord speaks of healing the brokenhearted, delivering the captives, giving sight to the blind, setting at liberty those who are bruised, the Lord is speaking of a spiritual and an emotional healing for others. 
And this is a great thing for others, right? But here's the deal. Here's the deal. He's not going to leave us out. He's speaking of this same healing process for you as well. And it's not selfish. You must learn to love yourself enough to be willing to get healing and deliverance and liberty for yourself first. And this is necessary for your fulfillment in life. But it's also necessary for you to be able to love others the way that you need to love others. Because love has everything to do with life. Love is life. Here's number two. You must desire deeper relationships. You heard what I said. Did did I hear somebody say, duh? Well, let me tell you something. It's not a given. And you have to understand that relationships are the things that heal and help us. But relationships are also the thing that has hurt us in the past. Think about that. Relationships heal us, but relationships are the thing that also hurt us in the past. And many times through our own hurts and pains of life and our interactions with with close relationships in our life, we have to realize that we oftentimes guard ourselves from others because we've been hurt. And sometimes we don't even realize that we're even doing this. It's just this deep-rooted automatic response in some of us to, to only allow people, even those people that are good for us, sometimes we automatically put up a wall. And we only allow others to get so close to us, and then they hit that wall and can't go any further. This wall is a defense. We're being defensive. And if someone is going to share a hard truth with us, for instance, we sort of get defensive, right? And sometimes that automatic defensive response is even with our spouses or our kids or our church family or those close friends who who would likely be a huge support in the time of need. And when we only allow those relationships to go so far, it just sort of inhibits our ability to truly love like Jesus wants us to love. But on the flip side, when we can move in close to someone and we can actually desire those deeper relationships, more intimate relationships, and when we can withhold our defensiveness It's amazing how that can truly transform our ability to love like Jesus. It's amazing. Because love, I want you to know, love has everything to do with life. Love is life. The third way that this has helped me love others better, or the third thing that has helped me love others better, is number three, we must be for the other person. And again, I warned you, it's going to sound overly simple, but it's not. It's the most fundamental need of any relationship in our life, whether it's a spouse, a kid, a coworker, a subordinate, it doesn't really matter. The, the other person needs to feel your support. They need to know that you're for them. I accept you, Dr. Williams. Turn to your neighbor and say, I accept you. (laughs) 
Now, didn't that feel good? Of course it felt good. It feels great when you're, when you're truly being authentic with someone that you love and you speak things that are accepting. Or you do things that are accepting. It just feels great. I want what's good for you. And you've got to ask yourself, are you just, are you just taking what you can get out of the relationship? Or are you obeying scripture that says that it's better to give than to receive? Think back on the last relationship that you can remember that, that you didn't feel accepted. I want you to think about that right now. You didn't stay in that relationship very long, did you? No, of course you didn't. Or if you did, if you were forced to, you had no motivation to really invest in that relationship that you didn't feel accepted. No one is gonna feel love and care from someone that doesn't accept them. So being for the person that you love is vitally important. Final thing that has helped me love others better. Number four, we must attune, contain, and relate to the person we want to love. All right, Ryan, what, what does all that mean? Attune, contain, and relate. Let me put it in simple words. We have to listen. I can't put it any more simply. We must listen to the person that we want to love. Now, again, that sounds simple. But ask yourself, are you truly listening? Have you ever had a friend that would just talk, 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 talk? And you'd try to get a word in and they'd talk a little more? I have pretty good insight on things like this, and I'm going to bet that they probably were not your friend for very long. Or at least you didn't feel connected. And that's where, that's where, it, really, that's where it really lies. You didn't feel connected to them. You didn't feel loved by that person. And so if you really want to love like Jesus loved, we have to do what Jesus did with people, sort of like the woman at the well. And we have to do what the experts call active listening. Active listening is where you tune in to what the other person is saying. We just, we listen to what they're saying. And maybe even to what they're not saying. And we pick up on an emotion and we just sort of pay attention to the emotion that we're seeing or hearing. And then we may respond with understanding and, and, and we respond with an acknowledgement that we just heard them and, and we don't jump to advice or, or even our own perspective, but we, we just respond with care and concern. We affirm them or we may encourage them, or, or show respect for them, or forgive them, or celebrate with them. We're just sort of present with them. And believe it or not, as simple as that may sound, this is what speaks love to someone. And it's super important because love has everything to do with life. Love is life. I want you to listen to 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 4 through 7 again. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemingly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. 
beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And from these verses, these are the things, this, these are the things that have helped me love others better. One more time, number one, you gotta love yourself first. Number two, you must desire deeper relationships. Number three, we must be for the other person. Number four, we must attune, contain, and relate to the person that we want to love. Now remember, Paul sandwiched this love chapter right in the middle of these two spiritual gifts chapters. And he's stressing that the atmosphere of these spiritual gifts should function in an environment of love. And so Paul was elevating the need for love in the midst of all of these spiritual gifts. And he's saying that without love, all of these spiritual gifts and knowledge and faith and good deeds, they're, they're all meaningless. In those first few verses of 1 Corinthians 13, they establish the supremacy of love. Love is superior. And then these next few verses, verses four through seven, they walk through the characteristics of love and this is what love actually should look like in your life. And then the last few verses of the chapter show that love is enduring. Love is gonna outlast any other gift. If you do those things, if you portray those characteristics, it's gonna be enduring. And you can have some amazing gifts, you can have some amazing accomplishments in life, but love is gonna surpass any of those things. And you see, when we realize that love has everything to do with this life, we move from a partial and an incomplete nature of understanding and use of those gifts, and we move to a full and a complete nature when we fully understand and see God. And when we fully relate to the people that are most precious around us. You see, love has everything to do with life because love is life. But I want us to go back to our text. 1 John 4, 16, real quick, and I'm hurrying. We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Pastor Andrew preached just a, a week or so ago and he basically said that you may be right with God but you may not have a relationship with God. And I'm telling you, I was sitting right over here and that just sort of grabbed me when he said that. And I want you to listen to it for yourself. Play that clip for me. You can have acceptance with him and not have a relationship with him. You can have acceptance with him and not have a relationship with him. You can have awareness of who he is, but you may not have a relationship with who he is. You can have a conversation with who he is, but you may, may not have a relationship with him. I'll meddle a little bit in your theology. You can have miracles, signs, and wonders and not have a relationship with him. You can even prophesy about him and not have a relationship with him. And too many people are excited and encouraged and confident in the extracurricular, and they've lost the vision of the relationship with him. I don't want to 
just know who he is. I don't want to just have an awareness of who he is. I don't want to just have an experience of who he is. I don't want to just preach about who he is. I don't want to just see healing and miracles and signs and wonders of who he is. I want a relationship with him. I want that daily if we walk in the light. It's so true. It's so true. It's possible that we can have an awareness of who God is, but we may not actually dwell in the love of God. And it's possible that we can even have a conversation with him. We can have a prayer life. It's possible that we can even be used in the gifts that he's provided us and not actually dwell in the love of God. And so what's the solution, Ryan? Thank you for asking. I'm glad you did. I think the solution is found in 1 John 4, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. He that dwelleth in love He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So the solution is is that we dwell in love. Well, how do we do that? The things that I pulled from 1 Corinthians 13. And this is how you dwell in God and this is as as simple as I could put it. Number one, you gotta love yourself first. Number two, you must desire deeper relationships with people. Number three, we must be for the other person that we have relationship with. And number four, we must attune, contain, and relate to the person that we want to love. These are the things that communicate love. These are the things that help us dwell in love with others. But ultimately, with God. And let me just say this. You may think I'm a little crazy, but I believe that our relationship with the Lord is gonna be comparable to our relationship with others. I'm not talking about your use of gifts I'm not talking about your use, your, your abilities. I'm talking about your relationship with God is going to be comparable to your relationship with others. In other words, if our love for others is flawed, then our love for God is usually going to be flawed as well. Because God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And God in him. Folks, I'm standing before you tonight telling you that we've got to learn to love others well. And here's the deal. When we learn to communicate love to others. When we learn to dwell in love with others, our love for the Lord is going to be so much purer and so much more powerful. What's love got to do with it? I stand before you tonight and I say that love has everything to do with life. Because love is life. Why don't we all stand, and and real quickly, I know it's four minutes after eight, 
I'm not going to hold you, but just a minute longer. If you could come walk down. Let's just go home by way of the altar tonight, if you don't mind, as we normally do on a Wednesday. I'm not going to hold you long. just want to walk down and pray for just a minute. I want to challenge you tonight. I want to challenge you. Think about those four things that I just gave you. If you didn't write them down, go back and listen to them on the, on the web. But I want to challenge you to choose just one of those four. I don't want to overwhelm you with all four of them. Just one. I want you to, 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 to read those again, listen to them again, and choose one that you can work on. Number one, you got to love yourself first. Number two, you must desire deeper relationships. Number three, we must be for the other person. Number four, we must attune, contain, and relate to the person we want to love. Now, I want to challenge you to take a very specific 1 Corinthians 13 step towards loving someone in your life more effectively. This week, how many of you will take this challenge with me? Most of you will. Because here's what I know. I know that love has everything to do with life. Because love is life. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And I'm telling you from experience with my own family and those that are closest to me, I promise you it works. I promise you it works. If you truly, if we truly love others, I believe that we can truly dwell with God because love has everything to do with life. Love is life. Why don't you lift your hands right now? And I want us to pray together, but I want you to pray individually right now. And ask the Lord right now. Ask the Lord to speak one of these four things into your mind right now. Now I want you to ask him, Lord, what can I do to improve my ability to love in that one thing? What can I do? Ask him that right now. Just a simple prayer. And now before we go home, I want you to, to join with your neighbor. And I want you to pray for him right now. Lift your voices. I'm not going to tell you how to pray, but I want you to pray for them right now. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Touch us tonight, Jesus. Touch us tonight, Jesus. Lord, let us embrace your word. Let us embrace 1 Corinthians 13, Lord. Let us dig deeper in it, Lord. And let us apply it to our lives, Jesus, in a way like never before, Lord. In the name of Jesus. 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 Love has everything to do with life. Won't you say that with me? Love has everything. 
to do with life. Hope you go home and have a good night. Thank you so much for being in church. I challenge you. Go do it.